To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy, infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception, as if an all-knowing authority. So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, no one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn, running exactly through this so-called fault disproving this so long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangsham Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying. No other ruins anywhere on our planet is surrounded with more controversy than that of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, or indeed its accompanying plateau. There are many factors to consider when it comes to Egyptology. Within academic fields, there are many no-go areas of study. Although hard work and research within permitted areas has taught us a great deal about the previous 4,000 years of the site's inhabitants. Yet regardless of the most astute academic thesis, there remains three, proverbially, large elephants in the room. When it comes to a full or even a mere fraction of an explanation in regards to the origin of these seemingly impossibly huge pyramids remains patiently absent. No accounts, illustrations of any kind from the era exists. It is simply illogical especially when one considers the sheer feat these structures must have been. We have presented many previous features, polygonal masonry being present on the pyramids. Eroded, yet younger casing stones protecting inner megaliths, clearly of a tremendous age. Salt sediment found encrusting the lower chambers, and so on, suggesting not only that the pyramids are much older than currently claimed, but were pre-flood ruins. Thus, questions arise. Just how old are the Great Pyramids? In addition to our study of the pyramids, we have also, in the past, asserted that the Sphinx was originally a lion, which, interestingly, correlates to the following hypothesis with fascinating accuracy. The Orion Theory 
The coincidence with pyramids aligned with Orion's belt and other significant constellational positions. Bavel and Hancock support the theory, believing the Great Sphinx was begun in 10,500 BC, creating reference to the constellation of Leo and the orientation of the entire complex with the Nile River and even Milky Way, claimed by them as connected respectively. Zeptepi, using similar methodology, put the age at over 13,000 years. These are clearly astonishing proposals, but the current paradigm for their chronology, we feel, is far too short a time span, and due to our own research, which has uncovered evidence indicative of pre-flood origins, copper tools for such an accomplishment a mere insult to intelligence. Yet, thankfully, due to these various takes on events, their age remains highly contested, and to us, a mystery, which is incredibly compelling. How can one still claim the pyramids to have been tombs when they are aware of the astounding burial chambers found within the Valley of the Kings? With the tomb of the sons of Ramses II being not only the largest, but what many archaeologists believe, second to the pyramids and their accompanying sphinx, is the next greatest discovery ever made within ancient Egypt. A literal labyrinth of chambers, it was initially discovered in 1825, yet due to its gargantuan scale, it wasn't until 1995, and thanks to an Egyptologist known as Kent R. Weeks, that we have begun to re-establish its true possible size. The tomb was examined several times, even being investigated by Howard Carter himself. Yet due to the outer tombs having been looted in antiquity, he simply used them as a dumping ground for rubble. It was not until 1995, during the Theban mapping project, when Weeks decided to clear the outer tombs. Approximately 70 rooms, lined along long corridors, running far back into the hillside were found. The number of rooms were then said to correspond to the number of sons the pharaoh sired. However, further excavations have revealed that the tomb is even larger, the size of an underground town cut directly from a granite hillside, its true scale still unknown. As of 2006, at least 130 chambers have so far been discovered, yet work continues on clearing the rest of this underground maze. We feel that although a later civilization, one lacking the knowledge to build such monuments, came along and claimed these relics as their own, with the possible motivation of an illusion of power, like that of the many other sites we cover worldwide, predictably, now also conveniently tied to these groups in academia. Yet the true feat these chambers would have been, along with the riches these pharaohs often left behind, are not only proof that these creations and collections of wealth were not only far beyond the ability of copper-wielding academically claimed builders, but that the archaeological evidence does indeed support the theory that these kings either ruled during the creator's civilization or built these monuments themselves. Yet how remains an infuriating enigma. We also feel their age, and indeed original lineage, in the true history of the Giza Plateau is what ultimately becomes convoluted. Yet I digress. Who built KV-5? It is a place we find highly compelling.
Discovered in 1860 within the astounding Valley of the Kings, the Atlantis Ring has since proven to have been a most incredible of finds. Not only for the secret sacred geometry that was found to have been inscribed upon this seemingly insignificant clay ring, but also for the strange, seemingly reoccurring pattern of curses or good luck talismans wrapped around the entire magic of this once incredible yet now lost civilization. Once discovered, it was said to cast a protective spell upon those who wore it. A supposed positive energy force that although as strange as that of the curse of Tutankhamun, is one that is far less mentioned within the career and discoveries of Howard Carter himself. This, regardless of the fact that it has since gone on to be an incredibly popular mass-produced product, once kept secret for many years by Carter himself. Also now sold under the claim that it does indeed emit a powerful energy field around the wearer. The science behind these claims we cannot claim to understand. However, the ring's modern popularity along with the lack of coverage regarding this possible legend within the discussion of Howard Carter's career, we have found peculiar. Featuring two triangles, six small and three larger rectangles with a semi-cylindrical form, it was originally found by Marquis de Grain. A blueprint of the ring was soon sent to Carter himself, who made and wore a secret replica which he kept himself until his death in 1939. In 1922, Carter would discover King Tut's tomb. Before opening the tomb, hieroglyphics above the tomb's unbroken seal were read. It said, The wings of death shall touch all who violates the Pharaoh's eternal rest. Unperturbed, they opened the tomb, discovering treasures beyond all of their wildest imaginations. Yet, as warned, all who were involved in this discovery eventually met curious fates. With just Carter himself left, the one person who was undeniably the most guilty party in the entire excavation. He would not die until 17 years later, at the reasonably young age of 66. During these 17 years, however, the flurry of media attention around the claimed curse persisted. Interestingly, whenever asked how he had seemingly escaped the curse for so long, he would always reply that he had a secret talisman a good luck charm that protected him from the curse. This initial cast of the ring Carter had made, it turns out, he seemingly knew of its incredibly important geometric significance. Yet it was not until 1940, while going through his documents, that his studies and indeed rules of wearing the ring were revealed to the world. His talisman, a replica of the Atlantis ring, a relic many thousands of years old, Originally made from Eswan and clay, like something out of a Holy Grail story, it seems the least valuable, seemingly most conspicuous of finds turned out to be one of the most, if not the most valuable to Howard himself. Out of all the golden wonders he had ever unearthed, this one, one which he didn't even discover himself, he kept closest to his heart. It is because of this that we find the Atlantis ring highly compelling.